Welcome to the workshop, Fatigue, what it is, what it is not, why it happens, and what can we do about it. My name is Michaela O'Brien, and I will be your moderator for this workshop. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Grisha Sirkin. Dr. Sirkin is a cancer rehabilitation physiatrist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. He helps patients figure out why they are having trouble performing certain tasks and then uses targeted exercise interventions, devices, and changes to their daily routine to help patients achieve their goals. Dr. Sirkin sees patients through their entire cancer journey and tries to help them with every, every, help them every step of the way. He occasionally prescribes medications for pain and other side effects of cancer treatment and works closely with oncologists to ensure that rehabilitation interventions are safe and effective. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sirkin. All right, thank you very much for the salt box. Um, I will, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and we will begin. So these are the learning objectives for today's presentation. We will talk about uh, why uh, fatigue happens acutely and chronically in the short term and in the long term before, during, and after stem cell transplant. We will talk a little bit about the difference between normal fatigue and fatigue experienced by patients who undergo stem cell transplant. We'll talk a lot about strategies on uh, energy conservation and how to uh, plan things and be able to complete uh, tasks. We'll talk a lot about the role of exercise, sleep and nutrition, and managing fatigue. And I will briefly touch about uh, the role of medications in managing fatigue. So uh, the transplant-related fatigue is a subset of cancer-related fatigue, which is a very complicated phenomenon. And uh, one of the most distressing things about it from the patient perspective is that no matter what you do, it doesn't seem to go away. And even tiny little things that you know normally wouldn't be bothersome at all can be quite exhausting. From physician perspective, it's a very complex phenomenon because as physicians, we like to measure things. And unfortunately, there is no good blood test or an x-ray or any other kind of uh, procedure that can accurately describe what fatigue is. So a lot of the time, we have to rely on patients' own perception of what is going on. And um, despite hundreds of studies, it's not truly 100% clear what are the factors which uh, result in um, transplant and cancer-related fatigue. But um, most importantly, the net result of cancer-related fatigue and transplant-related fatigue is that patients have trouble making things happen. Now, if you think about what goes into making things happen, there's uh, a number of steps that need to occur. You know, first, you have to decide what you want to do then generally you have to have some raw strength, sort of power burst, you know, typically called anaerobic power to overcome initial inertia. So think about getting out of bed in the morning can be quite a, quite a challenge. And then if the task that you need to accomplish uh, requires multiple steps, you do have to have some endurance to see things through to completion. And if it's a task that requires um, several hours, you know, at some point you will have to refuel and you will have to rest and then, you know, complete the cycle and maintain focus. And I'm sure as we all can appreciate, problems can happen along every step of the way. You know, you could have a little, little chemo brain fog. You know, you could have some weakness that really does make it difficult to get out of bed or make that first step. You know, you can feel like you're out of gas and just don't have the endurance to, you know, walk 100 feet, let's say. You know, we, we do know that um, sometimes um, there's not a whole lot of appetite and there are all sorts of gastrointestinal issues uh, in the transplant uh, process that can make it hard to get nutrients in. And, of course, sleep can also be uh, disordered, which makes things hard. Now, when we think about... Uh, the most basic down to molecular level mechanism that makes all of these things um, possible 
it all boils down to one single molecule. That molecule is called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. It's a molecule that is responsible for running literally every single process, um, every single instant of observable work in human body. So for example, thinking, nerve function, brain function is just a bunch of electricity running from one place to the next. And that electrical flow is accomplished by uh, pumps which are run on ATP. When you try to uh, lift something heavy, you need ATP to release energy and make the muscle contract. And when you have to go long distance, you have to have a lot of ATP production to sustain work over a period of time. Over anything longer than 20 seconds, you need some new ATP production. And so this uh, energy coin, this ATP, is generated in the following fashion. You know, this is very basic, um, but basically the air that we breathe in and the food that we absorb gets, uh, gets transferred to the blood and then our heart pumps out the blood and the oxygen and nutrients into every single tissue. And inside every single tissue, there is this... Uh, a uh, cellular component called the mitochondria, or mitochondria, which is the multiple. Uh, it's the part of a cell which is responsible for using oxygen and fuel to make that ATP. And so um, this is where things become slightly more convenient for um, the uh, physicians and the scientists because this uh, process, the efficiency of this process, the efficiency of using oxygen to uh, burn energy, create ATP, and make more work is actually something that we can objectively measure. And we measure this um, efficiency, this production, in what's called uh, metabolic equivalence or METs. And so the uh, designation is that one metabolic equivalent is the energy cost uh, or oxygen consumption of doing nothing except for laying down and breathing quietly. And from multiple experiments, we know that every single thing that we do has a certain metabolic cost. Like for example, making a bed is about three times as energy demanding as doing nothing. And going up a staircase requires almost five times the energy of doing nothing. And uh, because of a large number of uh, studies which are done over the years, we now know that for a person to maintain uh, independence, being able to do everything that they want, they have to be able to produce about four and a half METs. So in other words, if you're um, unable to get to about, you know, four times, four and a half times the energy uh, expenditure slash oxygen consumption, you will probably need help with at least something. You will no longer be independent. And so how all of this was figured out, you know, we'll, we'll take a little bit of a travel back in time, uh, almost 100 years ago, and uh, this uh, distinguished looking gentleman is uh, Otto Warburg. Uh, he's a German physicist who received a 1931 Nobel Prize in Medicine for his work on discovering the me mechanisms by which cells are able to mint that energy coin. And this discovery is so significant that in oncology, there is this uh, term called the Warburg effect. And, you know, in my perspective, Warburg effect basically means that when patients uh, develop cancer, somehow this energy coin mint becomes messed up. And what uh, Otto Warburg figured out over 100 years ago is that cancer cells prefer to be very, very inefficient when trying to uh, uh, make those ATPs. They use a lot of glucose. And this is the exact reason why PET scans, uh, where patients received a radioactively labeled uh, glucose and then have a scan to see exactly where cancer is, that's why these uh, scans are so sensitive. And so uh, one of the theories proposed over 100 years ago, and which is now gaining more and more traction in uh, uh, modern literature, is that um, when cancer progresses, it does try to shift the rest of the body, even normal cells, into a less efficient mode. So even, even normal body parts start to lose their efficiency and become burning more fuel in, and not generating a whole lot of those energy coins. And so under normal circumstances, 
with the conditions are right, out of one molecule of sugar, um, a human cell can make up to 36 energy coins or 36 molecules of ATP. And in a state of um, uh, cancer, that deficiency goes down to only two ATPs from one uh, molecule of sugar. So you can imagine that uh, this uh, change in how much energy can be produced can definitely affect how a person functions. And so uh, for the purpose of you know, physical work, doing things, uh, going from point A to point B, the majority of the uh, ATPs are, of course, used by muscle fibers. And I think it's important to know that uh, there are several different types of fibers. So even, for example, if you look at one muscle, like, for example, the bicep or the muscle that bends the arm, um, under a microscope, you can see that there are different types of muscle fibers inside the belly of the muscle. So there are type 1 fibers, which are typically more red because they are more endurance-oriented. Um, they can't generate a whole lot of force, but they're very, very fatigue resistant, and they can go um, do work for a very, very long time. Then we have uh, a hybrid fibers, type 2A, or uh, some of them are part 2A, part 1. These are fibers that can do a lot of work, but are also relatively fatigue resistant. They can uh, resist them. They can go long. They can go um, and make work for quite some time. So uh, an analogy from sports world would be type 1 is like a very long distance runner, so who can run for 100 miles, 200 miles, and a type 2 fiber, type 2A fiber, would be someone who is like a decathlete. You know, they can jump, they can run kind of fast, but not very far. And then there's the last uh, type of muscle fibers. They're type 2B or type 2X. These are muscle fibers which are exceptionally powerful. You know, these are, these are the fibers that allow people to do crazy things like deadlift 1,000 pounds, for example. But these fibers um, have very, very little to no resistance to fatigue. So those are the, the do-it-once fibers. And so um, when um, attention is paid uh, to uh, how chemotherapy and um, other drugs used in cancer treatment um, affect muscle, it becomes uh, clear that there's several mechanisms uh, which impair the work of muscle. There is, in, in some situations, there can be direct damage to the muscle fibers, and there uh, appears to be preferential uh, damage to specifically the power fibers, so it would be the muscle fibers that allow people to uh, overcome the force of gravity and get out of bed in the morning. And then also, it's fairly common for patients to develop neuropathy, and when nerves suffer damage, the muscles which are supplied by those nerves also get weaker. Now. We know from some animal studies that the damage to the muscle can persist a little bit longer and be more um, profound when injury happens not just once, but uh, uh, several days in a row. So for example, um, it's not uncommon for patients to receive a chemotherapy regimen that have a muscle toxic drug on day number one and then a different muscle toxic drug on day number three or day number seven. So, it, you know, it becomes a fairly challenging situation. Now, when these uh, damage mechanisms are looked at under the microscope um, and on down to molecular level, in the end what we find is that uh, definitely the strength of muscle fibers go down uh, and the endurance of the fibers goes down. And um, as I already alluded, uh, the work of the muscle becomes less efficient and sometimes muscle cells even die. And um, there's definitely a good amount of uh, this mitochondrial damage or messing up the energy production system of the muscle that goes on. And so why I am saying all of this potentially unpleasant and uh, depressing things, it's, it's this. So, you know, we're creating the ca cancer and cancer treatment can certainly create challenges. Yeah, and we also know that when we're not feeling so well um, and we're, you know, laying down, taking some rest, um, that's potentially also complicating things a little bit. So if you take a perfectly healthy, fit individual who is in a space cadet training program, 
if you put them in bed for a course of 24 hours, you will find the following things. If you keep them in bed long enough, up to a week, they will lose about 5% loss of muscle strength and about 3% of muscle size. Um, so that indicates that, you know, it's not just about the size, it's also something else happens uh, that makes, that impairs the performance. And that probably has to do with the loss of muscle memory um, or the connections between the nerves and the muscles becoming slightly more frayed. Then um, we do know that it seems that the, the larger leg and thigh muscles are the ones that seem to be affected first by this immobility. And uh, to make things even more complicated, um, people can be more prone to lightheadedness and dizziness after you know as little as 24 hours of laying in bed. And so what this all comes down to is that if you're tired, if you're undergoing cancer treatment, you know, you're not moving a whole lot, um, chances are you may not start moving unless something happens. And so oftentimes um, when patients come to me uh, with concerns of fatigue and inability to do things, um, you know, they say things like, well, you know, if I could just work a little bit harder, things would probably happen. Or, you know, doctor, I've been lazy recently. And I hope that I've been able to convince you all that the reason why this fatigue and inability to do things um, happens is definitely not because someone is lazy or because they're not working hard enough. Uh, it's, it's because the cancer and its treatment undermines the cellular machinery and the the very tools that we use to, you know, do the job and get things done and, uh, you know, move through life on day-to-day -day, uh, day -day basis. Now, uh, the idea that, you know, if you just stimulate people a little bit, give them, you know, caffeine or give them medications which are typically used for attention deficit hyperactivity, hyperactivity disorder, like the stimulant medications, um, it turns out the effect of those medications in cancer patients is very, very small, less than 10%. And what's uh, more concerning to me specifically is that um, these medications come with as high as 30% risk of worsening someone's sleep habits. And as we know, sleep is very, very important. And the conclusion uh, of the studies that look at the use of stimulant medications for cancer-related fatigue is that primary interventions for cancer-related fatigue should be exercise or some sort of a psychological uh, intervention or exercise plus a psychological um, intervention, but definitely not the uh, drugs, stimulant drugs is the first line. And so in speaking about the mindset, you know, there's this, um, it's easy to fall into the trap of, uh, you know, trying to accept responsibility for everything that happened and, you know, be upset about things that, you know, maybe not have gone right. But, um, you know, it's also important that, um, you know, every, every day you can do something different. Every day you can try something new. And there is a system in uh, modern psychology called um, positive thinking psychology, which um, basically takes advantage um, of the fact that if you keep track of good things uh, and make those things feasible and palpable, like write a letter or write a little a diary entry and plan for good things, plan and, you know, take, take stock in accomplishing those things, you will actually feel better. You know, and this is a, this has been tried uh, recently in uh, transplant recipients and it was found that even though the effect of, you know, trying to uh, keep a positive diary and write some little something once a week is, is not, you know, the, the effect wasn't, you know, super large, it was still significant. Significant, And, you know, in my mind, um, I, I always wonder if, if you do something good for you only once a week and it leads to a positive outcome, if you try to do this, once a day, wouldn't it uh, lead to a, to a better outcome? And so that's also been studied in a, in a, um, in a way uh, where patients who are undergoing a uh, stem cell transplant were asked 
to do about half an hour of uh, mindfulness exercise. So they were asked to basically relax, lay in bed, and uh, you know concentrate their thoughts on the lower belly, and you know do some very gentle moving in bed while well, laying down in bed, and do relaxation breathing for 10 minutes, meaning uh, slowly taking deep breaths in and slowly taking deep breaths out, and then finish with uh, 10 minutes of uh, a gentle ankle rotation and brushing hair and uh, stroking your face and just do a nice gentle stretching of the arms and the legs. And it turned out that consistently doing something that's really not demanding at all resulted in pretty interesting uh, changes in their blood counts. So these were the results from that uh, mindfulness and conscious breathing study, which showed that patients who did uh, these, these breathing and um, you know, mindful interventions were able to maintain their cell counts, uh, whereas patients who did not had a significant uh, drop in white cell counts after six weeks. So now, you know, switching gears a little bit and uh, talking about the physical side of things, um, you know, it, it may seem counterintuitive that, you know, when you're already short on energy coins, why would you want to spend more of those coins in an effort to get better? And so one of the first studies that actually uh, looked at trying to make, exor- trying to use exercise to make transplant patients feel better now almost 30 years ago did exactly that. Um, This was a study of uh, 20 transplant patients, 17 who had donor transplant and three had own transplant. Uh, They were all fairly young. On average, these were 36 year old Germans. They were 14 to, sorry, 18 to 14 days after the transplant. And five days a week, they were made on a treadmill. And uh, every week, the speed of the treadmill was increased a little bit. And so it turns out that even the, even though these patients were um, doing something that was quite tiring, five days a week, uh, they were managed to increase their speed in the distance um, and, more importantly, suffered no effects from doing it. So they definitely did not feel more tired, and most of them actually started to feel a little bit better. Now, you know, one would say, well, you know, walking on a treadmill under supervision of a German exercise physiologist uh, is, is probably, you know, not, not, not very practical because not everyone can, access, can have access to that. And it turns out that, you know, since that study, there's been many, 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 many different uh, interventions that basically included that no matter what exercise you choose, as long as it's not super strenuous, um, and as long as it's done more or less regularly, even during treatment, even during the transplant process, uh, there are no side effects. Um, patients definitely do feel better physically. Um, they demonstrate objective improvements in endurance markers. Uh, they report better fatigue scores. And in some studies, it was found that patients who exercised had fewer days with nausea. And you know, none of the exercises were uh, extremely you know, challenging. There's uh, some, some studies that use stationary bikes, some just use walking in the hallway uh, or going up or down stairs. Um, some used um, easily accessible things like resistance bands or stretching using hospital beds or hospital chairs. Um, however, all of these interventions, of course, were done under supervision of either a physical therapist or a rehab aid or you know, some other health uh, personnel. And so the next question that you might ask, well, it's it's okay, you know, to do exercise under supervision of a trained professional, but, you know, can you really exercise without supervision and be successful? And it turns out uh, that, yes, in fact, you can. Um, so this is a study that's almost 20 years old at this point, and uh, this was an examination of 17 Floridians. Uh, on average, they were about 49 years old, and they were 16 months after a transplant, and Majority of patients were um, uh, received their own cells, and there were four patients that study who received donor cells. And they were basically instructed to exercise at least three times a week uh, for at least 20 minutes, and uh, they were supposed to work out hard enough uh, that made their heart rate um, go up, and they could observe that uh, on, on a heart rate monitor that they were. Patients were 
allowed to do what they wanted. They could either do some cycling or some walking. They could do some swimming because in Florida you have access to swimming. Uh, they could do exercise videotapes. And uh, what was found in, in that um, investigation was that uh, after 12 weeks, uh, fatigue scores, and that would be the, the thin red line, the fatigue scores went down. But what was more impressive to me in that particular study, objectively measured uh, aerobic fitness went up by about 15%. Now, this is super, super important, and I cannot stress this more. Um, aerobic fitness or the ability of a human body to use oxygen to do work declines at the rate of about 10% per every 10 years of life. So if you are looking at a study or you're reading a report where they say uh, because of this intervention, uh, aerobic fitness improved 15%, 15 you could translate that into these patients just became 15 years younger. Now, if you're paying close attention to this chart, you will see that these patients, they weren't, you know, super fatigued uh, when they started um, at the outset. So their fatigue levels were about 4 out of 12, which is generally considered to be mild fatigue. And so the next logical question becomes, well, you know, it's easy to exercise when you're already not that fatigued, but, but what, if you're, what if your fatigue is quite severe? Will this work? Well, it turns out that, yes, in fact, it will. So um, this is a, also a study. It's a relatively small sample study. It's also almost 20 years um, at this point. And uh, this is an investigation that looked at 12 uh, Canadian patients who uh, were also on average about 49 years old. And they were about uh, three years from a donor cell transplant. So these were all allogenic uh, transplant recipients. And their exercise intervention was uh, stationary biking three times a week. And on Monday, they were instructed to do 20 minutes of easy pedaling uh, with the effort of about two out of 10, uh, zero being no effort at all, 10 being all out about to pass out kind of effort. And then on Wednesday, they were instructed to cycle for about 15 minutes uh, at moderate to high effort, so six out of 10 effort. And then on Friday, they were instructed to uh, cycle for 20 minutes at about 4 out of 10 effort. So, no, it's a relatively low volume intervention. Um, and it turns out that after 12 weeks, uh, these patients were able to demonstrate significant improvement in their fatigue scores. So they were about 7 out of 12, which is a, um, a severe fatigue score. Uh, after 12 weeks, uh, they were able to get those scores down to three. So they went from severe fatigue to mild fatigue. And what was most interestingly, those low fatigue scores, uh, they, they remained uh, low even uh, nine months after completing of the study. And as a nice bonus, when uh, these patients' aerobic fitness was measured, it appeared that it, was, it improved 17% over the course of 12 weeks. So that's saying like these patients got 17 years younger after a three month long intervention. It's pretty impressive, isn't it? So, you know, just to recap, so far we've talked um, a little bit about, well, I should talk a lot about physical interventions uh, or um, mental interventions, but what happens when you combine them? And this is really, really interesting. So this is a study that uh, came out last year uh, uh, this is out of Australia. They looked at about 21 patients who were about 56 years old on average. Uh, they were just over three years after a donor transplant. And this patient had, uh, these patients had six weeks of virtual coaching. So they had one hour session where a physiotherapist or some other exercise professional went over their exercise program, made sure that they were doing things right and answered their questions. Uh, they also had a 60-minute uh, mindfulness uh, session uh, led uh, remotely. And then they were instructed to uh, engage in uh, aerobic exercise for 20 to 30 minutes, uh, most days of the week, and uh, were uh, also instructed to do a resistant uh, bands workout uh, using you know, major muscle groups anywhere from three to five times a week. 
And so uh, what was found is that at the completion of that study, in three months, these patients displayed 27% gain in aerobic capacity and physical fitness. So that means uh, effectively these patients became 27 years younger, which um, I think is, is quite, quite, quite impressive. There's very few things uh, that can have that kind of an effect. And so uh, switching gears and talking a little bit about how we can power uh, all of these gains and uh, what problems can occur. Um, it's not uncommon for patients to develop mouth sores as they go through the transplant experience. Uh, their taste can be altered. Uh, nausea can happen almost universally during treatment and after treatment. And patients do develop uh, food intolerances from time to time. And uh, uh, unfortunately, in some cases, both stomach, uh, which is the upper gastrointestinal tract, and intestines, the lower intestine, can be affected by graft versus host, uh, which makes it very hard to absorb um, nutrients. Now, you know, I'm not a nutritionist, um, and, and it's, it's very, very important to have someone at hand who can explain uh, food choices and how um, they can help, how you can help um, um, get enough calories and building blocks to move forward. Uh, but what's important is that even simple things like keeping a bottle of water on hand to keep your mouth from being too dry and regularly brushing your teeth and having good access to a dental health professional can uh, both improve uh, ability to chew, ability to eat and swallow. And um, as we remember from the getting things done diagram, uh, after fueling up, it's important to rest. And um, we do know that uh, the prevalence of insomnia in transplant recipients can be quite high. And not surprisingly, it appears that the biggest problem are the hospitals themselves, where uh, regardless of uh, whether you're in Turkey or in Germany, if, if, if you are admitted to a hospital, insomnia levels can be quite high. And you know, when I, when I do my hospital rounds, uh, certainly it becomes a running joke uh, when I ask patients whether or not they slept well. The usual response is, have you ever tried sleeping well in a hospital? Uh, that's quite challenging with all the uh, bells and whistles and alarms that go on. Um, and even past the hospital admission, you know, patients can have uh, persistent issues with uh, restroom, um, having to use the bathroom at night. Um, they can have persistent pains. They could have restless, restless, restless legs and things of that sort. You know, and, and there are things like, you know, trying to, for example, um, do most of the drinking, uh, that is water drinking, not alcohol drinking, most of the fluid consumption in the first half of the day so that not as much urine is produced during the night. Uh, there are simple things like uh, wearing compression stockings during the day and uh, laying down with your feet elevated for about 20 minutes before you go to sleep and then trying to use the restroom right before you go to sleep so you won't have to use the restroom as frequently during the night. Um, and then uh, certainly when, 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 when necessary, we can use things for uh, restless leg syndrome or for neuropathy that could be interfering with the sleep. So it's important to talk to your oncologist or supporting care specialist about that. Now, um, I know we talked a lot about different uh, types of exercise and um, certainly pandemic created uh, challenges in, in people accessing you know, exercise spaces, uh, gyms, um, even physical therapy facilities. And so one of the things that uh, we kind of came up with in trying to figure out how to get people to do things um, on their own time and uh, without much access to equipment, we basically came up with this uh, cheapo scheme. In other words, um, in, in trying to pick uh, an, an intervention, you know, we looked for things that cost nothing, that have meaning. In other words, if we're going to try to do some exercise, it should be something that has uh, functional relevance and practical significance to things that you do on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Now, it's an exercise that should be easy and safe, 
to do at home or you know if you're visiting someone for example it's an exercise that should be adaptable you know if you're having a good day you should be able to do it if you're having a slightly worse day you should be able to do it still uh, maybe with slight modification um, ideally you want an exercise that is portable meaning you can do it anywhere and it's an exercise that is outcome friendly meaning it's easy for you to track your progress because you know as we know what gets measured gets managed and so of all the things uh, which have been tried with uh, transplant recipients and uh, general population and patients with um, other types of cancer, um, we decided that this simple act of getting up from a chair seems to fit all of those buckets. You know, uh, everyone has a chair, uh, so it, uh, you definitely don't need any equipment uh, for that except for something that's sturdy and not going to fall apart. Um, we know that. Um, this chair rising uh, intervention has been uh, linked to many good things. Uh, we know that uh, if you practice, it definitely gets better. Uh, we know that it correlates very well with fatigue scores uh, in um, uh, both uh, cancer patients, breast cancer patients, and in transplant recipients. And so, uh, interestingly, when we look at the complicated uh, uh, phenomenon like cancer-related fatigue, we know that if we you know, change one factor in the patient's life, it can change the score, fatigue score a little bit. If we change two factors, it can you know, change the fatigue score some more. And so in breast cancer patients, it was found that if you change their ability to do this chair rise test, in other words, if you train people to get better at getting up from a chair, it explains about 50% of the change in their cancer-related fatigue score, which I think uh, is, a, is a pretty good uh, evidence for this, this, this physiologic, this, this energy production basis uh, for the cancer-related fatigue. And so, you know, um, when you try to do things for exercise purpose, you know, you have to have a plan. So you have to know, you know, when to do it, how much to do it, how much not to do it. And so, um, as I'm sure many of you have uh, seen in the popular media and the news, you know, um, interval exercise, uh, interval training exercise is something that's uh, touted, you know, every once in a while, like it's the best thing since uh, sliced bread. It's so effective, it's so efficient, anyone can do it. Um, it's so, you know, it's so well published that, you know, there's even this uh, New York Times scientific seven minute workout application available for uh, most of the smartphones. And so the basic underlying principle of interval training is that if you do something really, really, really hard and you take a tiny little break and you do something really, 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 really hard again and take a tiny little break and, you know, do this in short cycles you know, in the span of uh, eight minutes, you're going to get some benefits. And so the trouble with uh, high-intensity interval training is that even if you're a relatively healthy college age person, it's really, really unpleasant. And it's actually kind of really, really hard to do. And so you can imagine, you know, taking a person who is quite, quite fatigued and maybe not feeling so great and asking them to do something that's really, really, really hard and unpleasant, it's probably not a very good uh, strategic plan. And so, you know, this certainly uh, was a thought that uh, um, other doctors 40 years ago had, and they realized, well, you don't quite have to go really, 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 really hard, uh, and you can take much longer breaks between um, exercise sessions, and you can still get pretty good effects. And so one of those professors uh, is uh, Dr. Katharina Meyer, who's a cardiologist in Switzerland, and she, was, uh, she found that if you uh, play a little bit with how hard you ask patients to work and how much rest you give them between um, and between those exercise sets, uh, you can do safe and effective work even with patients who have uh, heart failure and even in patients who, uh, you know, just underwent heart surgery, for example. And um, since then, since, since mid-80s, this approach has been tried in a variety of cancer patients, and it certainly was found to be uh, effective and safe when done under appropriate supervision. And so... Now we're talking about exercise, of course, that we would want all of you to implement in your daily life. And 
what would be some of the rules that uh, you need to remember if you're trying to uh, in trying to start some sort of an exercise protocol. So these are the three rules that um, I give all of my patients. Uh, and the rule number one is if it hurts when you do it, don't do it. But uh, a little bit of for mild discomfort is okay sometimes, not all the time. You know, if, if there's a persistent problem, you need to talk to your healthcare specialist and you know try to figure out what that problem is. Uh, second rule is don't work too hard. Um, the effort when you do things should almost never come up higher than a six out of 10, you know, with zero being no effort at all and 10 being absolute hardest all out effort. In other words, even if you do some sort of physical activity as an exercise, you should feel a little bit tired when you're done, but you should have energy to do other things in your day, like, you know, enjoy a nice meal with your family or go out for a walk later or read a book or something. And the last rule is don't do things you regret. So, for example, if you do something and then the next day you feel overly sore or uncomfortable, then that probably wasn't the right thing to do or maybe not as much of it should have been done. And so this is how I try to implement these uh, principles where they sit to start training. So uh, the first thing that we do um, after some questioning and, and physical examination uh, we use those fancy exam chairs that go up and down to figure out how high the chair should be for a patient to be comfortable and be able to stand up without using their arms, that is using only legs. And then we see how many times a person can do uh, this, uh, get up and sit down in the span of 30 seconds. And we um, I instruct patients to maintain effort um, you know, uh, below six out of 10. And, you know, from doing this for years now, there's, I, I think maybe there's one time that someone said, yeah, this was a seven out of 10 effort. And so based on how many repetitions a person is able to do in those 30 seconds, you know, we then decide how we're going to make this into a uh, training program that they can do at home. So for patients who are able to do five repetitions in 30 seconds or less, or they need a really, really, really high chair you know, because they have joint pain or because they have significant amount of weakness, you know, we start practicing sit-to-stands twice a day. So these are the sunrise and sunset group. And for most people, their bed is much higher than a regular chair. So this becomes you know, quite convenient, you know, hence sunrise and sunset. So you uh, do the sit-to-stands after you wake up and you do the sit-to-stands before you go to bed. Uh, patients who are able to do six to 10 repetitions in 30 seconds become the breakfast, lunch, and dinner group. And that's probably the, the vast majority uh, of patients that I see in the clinic. So based on uh, how many they do, we um, uh, do three sets per day. And then patients who are you know, you know, more fit um, are able to do 10 more, uh, 10 or more interventions, 10 or more sit to stand in 30 seconds. They become the, the, the true interval training group. So, um, like this, this would be an example of a sun, sunrise to sunset uh, sit stand training program. So, if a patient is able to do three repetitions in 30 seconds, they will start with just one repetition on day one. So, they will do one sit to stand uh, in the morning and one sit to stand in the evening. And then the next day, they will do one in the morning and two in the evening. And then the following day, they do two in the morning, two in the evening, and so on and so forth, adding. Uh, only one extra repetition for every day of training, gradually building up to about 15 repetitions at a time. Then in the uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner group, the training looks something like this. So let's say a patient is able to do nine repetitions uh, during the uh, in-office test. So then they are instructed to start with four repetitions for breakfast, four for lunch, and four for dinner. And the following day, just add one extra repetition to the last set of the day and uh, continue until they get to about 15 repetitions per set. And similarly, for patients who are more advanced and are able to do more than 10 repetitions a set, uh, we advance in the uh, uh, same manner, except their exercise is done only in uh, one five-minute session per day. So um, the patients are instructed to get a timer uh, and after they are warmed up a little bit, so they work, walk around the room a little bit, um, they get the timer going, and when the minute begins, they do the set number of repetitions, and then when the second minute begins, they do it again, 
and so on and so forth for set three and set four and set five. And this is quite condensed and very time efficient. And so uh, to underscore the importance of keeping track and holding yourself you know, accountable, I'd like to share with you a couple of cases. Um, so this was a situation of a 61-year-old uh, patient who was readmitted to the hospital with very severe uh, stage four graft versus host uh, disease of his uh, GI system about a month after donor transplanted. And uh, this patient was in the hospital for seven months, uh, suffered multiple infections, lost essentially all the muscle and um, had uh, a recurrent issue with back and joint pain. And uh, what you can see in this x-rays is uh, this is someone who is not very, doesn't have very healthy joints and uh, in the words of one of our, one of our therapists, uh, this person had the stiffest hips ever. However, this patient had the goal to dance at a wedding about three months after hospital discharge. So when they returned home, they created this very intense looking, very involved uh, Excel spreadsheet where they tracked every step, every activity, different types of workouts. and. Uh, and eventually this patient was in fact able to dance at a wedding three months after, which I thought was kind of incredible. But, you know, this this type of uh, detail is overwhelming and it's not for everybody. And, you know, even simple things where you just kind of pencil things down as you go along on a simple table can actually be quite helpful and effective. So uh, these uh, scribbles came uh, courtesy of a patient who decided to practice it to stands at home and uh you know he was able to go from using a 28 inch high seat um in um, may to using a regular seat uh 22 inch seat only two months later and was able to increase uh, his performance from three repetitions per workout set down to uh, up to 14 repetitions and so with that, I would like to reiterate that the fatigue that transplant recipients experience is not a, a personal weakness or a char character flaw, that it's almost all of it just the results of the cancer process and the treatment process. That, you know, it's, it's important to start low or start where you can, um, proceed very, very slowly, and absolutely give yourself credit for every little thing that you're able to accomplish you know don't work too hard don't suffer too much pain try to stick to the routine so make your bed brush your teeth stay hydrated talk to your team and try to get some rest which can uh, require some changes like taking the tv out of your bedroom for example but it's a habit that will be very very helpful so um, I did share some of the links to um, easily accessible and easily done and safe uh, exercise videos. And with that, I welcome any questions, comments, or jokes. Thank you, Dr. Circuit, for this excellent presentation and those helpful videos. We will now begin the Q&A session. If you have a question for Dr. Circuit, please use the chat box on the left side of the screen to submit your question. We'll answer as, answer as many questions as possible. Our first question is, could you discuss the best diet to combat fatigue? Are carbs okay? Um, all right, so I have to uh, start by saying I am not a nutritionist, uh, but carbs are definitely okay um, because Carbs represent the most easily accessible form of energy that a person can absorb. And um yeah, that's 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 really it. Um carbs are uh important for both short term work and long term work. And um as I mentioned, there could be individual carb intolerances that develop during treatment. And it's very, very important to work with a nutritionist that can help you sort uh, these issues out. Um, from, you know, experience working with, with excellent, excellent nutritionists, you know, I will um, share with you that uh, one of the most helpful advices that they give their patients is that, you know, in trying to figure out what works and what doesn't, it's very, very important right to 
to write things down. So just like it's important to track the number of repetitions and such, it's important to write down what you ate and when you ate it and how it affected you so you can get a much better idea of what works for your body and what doesn't. This question comes from a caregiver whose spouse is almost five months post BMT. And when they're mm-hmm. sleeping, how can you tell if his body needs rest or should I wake him up and take him for a walk? Right. So um, this that is a great question. And so what I would say in that situation, it's very important to try to figure out if this excess daytime sleepiness is the result of poor sleep at night. And if so, the first step would be to try to fix this, uh, um, try to fix this uh, disordered uh, nocturnal sleep. Now, if the sleep at night is okay, and uh, this patient is still sleepy during the day, then what you do is you take advantage of those short periods of when they are awake during the course of the day. Now, um, that is why I think short little exercise sessions like, you know, the sit to stands, for example, or just sitting in a chair doing some seated marches or doing some stretching or breathing can be so, so valuable because there is nothing in the exercise physiology world that says, your exercise has to be done in one sitting, otherwise it's not uh, effective. It really is the total amount of physical activity that a person does in the course of a day that makes the difference. Um, In fact, when scientists who study longevity look at which people do the best uh, long-term, it is those people who are you know, not killing themselves in the gym one hour a day and then sit the rest of the day. It's the people who do a little bit of movement in the morning, a little bit, you know, it's basically people who try not to sit still. It's people who do a little bit of physical activity in little chunks spread out evenly throughout the course of a day. So I would say, you know, if your loved one is, you know, sleepy most of the day, do take advantage of the times that they are not sleepy. Uh, Because we do know that it's probably not a very safe idea to, you know, try to do exercise when you're about to fall asleep. Okay. This person is two years out from transplant, and they haven't been exercising. They want to start exercising. How long would it take to get back to the original strength I had? Oh, it's impossible for me to answer this question because I don't know what the baseline is. But uh, to if I extrapolate, um, you know, from from other patients that I take care of, I would say, um, depending on how active uh, a person is before the transplant, you know, let, let's say they're highly active. Let's say they uh, go to I don't know, like a boxing gym to do workouts, not necessarily to fight people, but just to be in that atmosphere and you know hit the boxing, uh, the punching bag a little bit and do some weights and do some, you know, skipping rope, um, it may take up to a year and a half to two years to get to that kind of uh, high-level activity. Okay, this person is also about two, two and a half years from an aloe transplant, and they get very fatigued in the later afternoon. Will this ever go away, or it will be something that stays with you for a while? Well, so so then the question, uh, my question would be, well, what have we tried to fix the situation? Um, Is this an issue where maybe, again, sleep is um, not um, as uh, good during the night? Um, Is this a situation where, um, you know, it's it's very easy for this person to... um, you know, get short of breath with with tasks. You know, is this is, is this is this a physical fatigue phenomenon, or is this more of an insufficient sleep mental fatigue phenomenon? And um, you know, if the sleep is good um, and there's just not enough gas in the tank at the end of the day, then I would say it's probably a good idea to start implementing interventions targeted to get more gas in the tank. So that would be. Uh, um, aerobic and some resistance training. 
Could you please address fatigue as it relates to low hemoglobin count and low pulmonary function test scores? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Excellent questions. So one thing that we do know is that patients can adapt to fairly significant insults uh, when given enough time. So for example, um, patients who or people who live at high altitudes, for example, become very efficient at extracting little oxygen uh, from the air with whatever blood cells that they have. And so I find that um, in my patients who are chronically anemic, for example, with hemoglobin of eight, you know, something that would be so low that in some situations there would be a contraindication to exercise participation, that over time, these low numbers really aren't that big of a factor because patients' systems learn to, uh, you know, be more efficient at oxygen extraction and using that oxygen to make ATPs and power cellular processes. Now, pulmonary um, impairments are a little bit more challenging in, in the sense that uh, there's different types of pulmonary impairments, right? So, um, Sometimes uh, patients can develop um, can develop issues where it is hard for oxygen to be diffused from air into the bloodstream. You know these ones are um, are sort of tougher to deal with. You know, but in the end, um, you can bypass pulmonary problems by improving peripheral adaptations, and this is why. Uh, cardiopulmonary rehabilitation or pulmonary rehabilitation is a recognized intervention. And the gist of it is that patients who have lung problems or heart problems are trained under supervision of a medical professional to, again, teach their periphery, teach their muscles uh, to be more effective, more efficient at uh, using whatever oxygen is in the bloodstream to do the work and overcome fatigue and uh, disability that way. Okay, it looks like we're running out of time, so this will have to be our last question. Do you have any data on expected fatigue durations after CAR T cell therapy? Um, no. Um, off the top of my head, I do not know of any, and uh, CAR T interventions are something that is new, and I am sure we will learn more about it in the next uh, few years. Um, but uh, what I can tell you is that the training principles um, as they relate to CAR-T and uh, a donor cell transplant and autologous transplants are essentially the same. The exercise works if you do it, uh, but you have to optimize things like sleep and nutrition to get the most out of it. Thank you. On behalf of BMT Implanet and our partners, I'd like to thank Dr. Sirkin for a very helpful presentation. And thank you, the audience, for your excellent questions. Please feel free to contact BMT Implanet if we can help you in any way. Enjoy the rest of the symposium this week. Thank you very much for your time. I hope this was helpful.